Very excited. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker of the day, Dr. Karen Kirkham. Dr. Kirkham is a member of the growing geriatric physician team at Ohio Health. I can tell you when I started a grant nine years ago, oh my goodness, uh, there was one, I think, maybe a... About Dr. Bob Scully, that was it. And now we have multiple, multiple. There's fellows running around here. It's fantastic. It's such a great service to have. As a director of geriatric education at Grant Medical Center, she practices on both the inpatient and the outpatient geriatric assessment teams. She is thrilled, says thrilled, uh, to be here today <laughs> to speak to you regarding the complex needs of older adults, and we're happy to have her. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Karen Kirkham. Am I remote up there? Oh, it's loud. Sorry. I'm really loud, so it doesn't need to be that close. Wow, so happy EMS week, I guess. I, I, this is a hard act to follow, right? When our families and our people are so fabulous. If we could change gears a little bit, um, you know, geriatrics is a little different pace. I know you guys pick our people up when they fall and break. Um, but I've grown to really appreciate all of you, both here and I was in Dayton for 23 years before I moved here a year and a half ago. And we really relied on all of you. Oftentimes our patients trust you way more than they trust us. And sometimes I would use my EMS team members in Dayton to get me into someone's home when they were not letting us in, particularly the hoarders, right? So today we're gonna talk a little bit about, I'm hoping something that is uh, a bit bothersome to all of you on how to approach some of our patients that are complicated, and also to give you maybe a new framework. I just came from our national meeting, the AGS meeting in Portland, and they introduced a new framework for us, and I find it very helpful, not only with our learners, but I think myself, I've reoriented how I think about my patients, because sometimes our patients are just totally overwhelming, okay? So let's see how this goes. Oops, there we go. So we're gonna talk about some of the older adult needs, how they're different, maybe give you guys some ideas, maybe how to reframe some things, be a little less frustrated with some of our people. Um, and then also I wanna resource you a little bit. What I've learned, I, by the way, I was internal medicine primary care physician, did home visits, hospice, I did the whole sort of like old fashioned thing except kids for 20 years. And I just did a geriatric fellowship four years ago at 51. So I was the oldest student in Dayton that year, I swear. Um, but I learned a lot, and what I learned is how much I didn't understand and I didn't know. And the number one thing I didn't know was how to resource these patients, and I wanna share some of that with you. I realize you guys are kind of in your role and how you are, I've learned from Mark Huckabee, this whole paramedicine thing. Everything is changing, but you guys are our eyes on in the houses. There are very few of us doing home visits. In fact, there's very few geriatricians. There's only 7,000 of us in the entire country and hardly any of those people practice full time, okay? So again, you have very few of us, you guys are our eyes on. And how to sort of maybe reframe the way you see things and make your job easier is a little bit of hopefully what we'll accomplish today. So lots of challenges, and I'm, I'm just reiterating them so we're kind of all on the same page going forward into the conversation. Lot more people living alone in the community. I just heard somewhere, I'm, I'm single parent for 16 years, so I pay attention to these, these data. That for the first time, the number of single people in this country outnumbers the number of partnered people, okay? So we have a, you know that. There are a lot more people alone in the middle of their dramas in their homes, okay? The funding for our resources, stating the obvious, is not at its peak, to say the least. Um, I was excited to hear that Adult protect Protective Services may get a substantial increase this year in the state budget in Ohio, so that'll help all of us. Um, there's increased complexity of needs. The advantage of you all saving people and all of us saving people is much more complicated people survive in the world and we have to keep sustaining them. Um, there's more of a disjointed, sort of expensive healthcare rhythm we're in right now. Um, because the majority of my life has become folks with dementia or cognitive impairment, traumatic brain injury, and older adults, it's really amazing how many times we keep going through the same loops and nothing seems to interrupt it. So hopefully we can find some opportunities there. Um, the idea of poverty and the opioid epidemic, particularly in our southern, southern region, I know it's everywhere, but for some reason I feel like even in Dayton, I thought I was in the mecca of the opioid issues, because we were for a while. I think Southern Ohio and our trauma team bringing folks up to us at Grant has really been quite humbling. 
and it impacts our older patients as well, and you know that. Sometimes folks with chronic pain can't even keep their pain medicines in their home because other people are partaking of them, and it becomes quite complicated for them to get relief of their suffering. So what I want to ask you guys is, if you could say, like, what's your biggest struggle when you see older folks? What, what would that be? You guys have to talk. I know you're not shy. EMS people are not shy. So what's, what's something that drives you crazy when you keep going to someone's home? All the kids there, ostensibly taking a lot of resources and time and adding chaos. Is that a good summary of it? But, but not being informed about what your patient needs, right? What else? Oh, our hoarders. I love our hoarders, though. They have some very interesting things when you finally get to go and spend some time there. You guys just have to, have to go in and out a lot. I get to hang out with them sometimes. But it is a problem, particularly for you guys when you're trying to get them out. I had a lady, I, I called her my farm lady in Dayton, and she lived out literally on a farm. They didn't even have central heat. They used a wood-burning stove in the winter. And Miss Jean was really difficult. Miss Jean weighs 450. And she is paralyzed in three of her four extremities from a variety of strokes and insults over the years. And daughter is still keeping her alive and trying to get her in transport and take her in was a nightmare because their home was so stuffed with things. What else? Okay, when you think you have a great idea that might help them, and they're like, yeah, no, thank you. They kind of almost freak out about having anybody in their space, right? Yeah, that paranoia problem. Mm -hmm. What else? They don't want to go to the hospital because of the money, particularly when, in regard to you guys, right? Because they pay the ambulance runs, right? And once they get the bill one time, then they don't want to go, but they'll still call you. <laughs> You're like, what am I supposed to do, right? The biggest frustration is their reluctance to accept resources and assistance. They don't want to go to the hospital. They don't want help. Mm -hmm. They don't, they just want to stay home and be left alone. Because they don't want to be a burden. They don't want to lose their independence. So what everybody's saying again is the idea that we have some things to offer them, but they're afraid that they're going to be labeled. And then what's the biggest dread of all of my patients? Going where? Nursing home, right? So that's the idea of geriatrics. And that's the idea as we're working with the paramedicine folks at Grant. And I'm sure all of you are doing interesting things in your communities as well. The idea, let's keep our people age in place, right? And so part of this is us changing our reflex to take them to the ER. I'm going to tell you the last place I want my dementia patients the emergency department, and I love my ED people at Grant, okay? And I loved my ED people at Premier in Dayton, Ohio, but I don't want my dementia patients there because once they're there, they get rowdy, and then they're stuck, okay? So there are certain things that as we move forward together, we have to start reframing things. And I'm not going to tell you you're going to leave here with answers. I'm going to give you some tips, but this is the beginning of a conversation, okay? Not only with all of you, but all of us in the continuum of these folks' care. And I'm sure you guys aren't all used to calling the primary care offices in the past, but maybe you're starting to once in a while when you keep going back to the same houses. And in a smaller community, you would know the primary care docs or the providers, our APPs and our PAs, right? Okay. So let's think about this patient. She lives here. This is one of our patients in the practice. And you know how the patients, you get to know certain ones in a very short order. So Ruth is 86. Ruth keeps calling our EMS friends, but a lot of times she won't go because <laughs> she doesn't want the bill, but she keeps calling. Every time the squad goes, she looks just a little bit worse and a little more clutter, okay? A little bit dirtier, a little more cat poop on the floor, right? She seems to be losing some weight, and she never really has anybody specific. She always talks about, you know, her son over in Clinton County or whatever, okay? But you never actually see this person. You don't even see any pictures in the house of family. And she says, she'll answer some questions, but again, she seems super defensive. And when you suggest doing anything, she gets very nervous and says, no, I don't need anything. But you're wondering to yourself, why does she keep calling me then? A lot of times it's the falls, but sometimes she'll even call and folks, in, and folks online will just talk to her and she'll hang up. Right? Anybody have patients like that? Yeah? So she doesn't have that support from her friends. Family, maybe they live far away. Maybe they don't want anything to do with her. And she just doesn't want to lose her independence. Yep. Yep. And it's sad, in a way, 
see what some of these people are and what they become. I transported a lady that had three master's degrees in education and there was early signs of dementia, was unable to care for herself. That's really sad to see a person that, you know, people that you know and know what they were to see them generated to that. Anybody else? Anybody else have any thoughts? I think the, the hardest thing for me, do you know when the, the last year we had a new medicine for cognitive impairment in this country? Oh, three. Oh, three. What disease have we not had a new drug for since oh, three that actually did anything? So it does feel very frustrating. So right now, a lot of times, we have to switch gears. And this is very hard for you guys. You guys are fix-it people, <laughs> right? I'm kind of the chill person. We laugh. It takes 20 minutes for our patients to walk from the front of the office to the back. We're relaxed. You guys, by then, you've already gone on two runs, OK? So this is a hard thing, but I, I want to encourage you to just be with your discomfort, because right now, we don't have any other answers for that, OK? You guys know more about CPR than we know about cognitive impairment and treating cognitive impairment. And then let's add a little TBI on top of it. Wow, that'll make it crazier, OK? Because you know, once my people hit their heads, their marbles never go back into place, and they really decline quite quickly, OK? So we sort of got through this. But I want to stop on the part that's your responsibility. You guys are all talking about burnout just as much as we are, all right? Part of the burnout is our lack of feeling like we can do anything. And it must be very acute for all of you because you guys, again, are fixers. I'm peaceful with the fact that the thing's broken, and we're just going to ride it as long as we can. <laughs> you guys go in, and you, you take things, and you fix these young people. It's amazing. So part of it is to be peaceful with yourself, that all you can do is what you can do with limited resources and limited science right now. So when you go into the house of someone who's super uber complicated, right, and they just keep calling you, I want to invite you to look at it this way. OK, I keep blocking all of you guys. Um, the number one thing for my patients is what matters to them. And that's not what matters to us for them. OK? I've been taking care of a patient on trauma at Grant this week. And the patient really wants to go home. Is he perfect? Oh, heck no. <laughs> He's a hot mess. And, and people just walking through his room kept telling me, Karen, are you sure he has capacity? Well, no, he's not fabulous. But sending him to a nursing home is not the life he wants. He's completely freaked out. So an imperfect life at home may be better than what we think is prettier in a nursing home. Okay, he may be cleaner there. He may have better food. His nails aren't dirty and long. But he's miserable there. Okay? So it's this new compromise we're making for our patients until we have something better to offer them. All right? So the what matters, that's the first thing. So it's the four M's. Matters, mentation, meds, and mobility. Hmm? You guys all know about the falls. And you know our fall people. The falls just say there's something wrong in there. There's something wrong behind that. Oftentimes, it's something we're doing with our medications. Okay? Oftentimes, it's their debility, their food insecurity, all those kind of things lumped together. But again, if we think about it, for well, and really any older patient, okay, who's alone and you're concerned about. Now, this is not the marathon runner. Okay, we have 80-year-old marathon runners. We have 96-year-olds who are worried well that come to our clinic. They test, they do better on the MOCA screening than we do. That's our, our version of MMSE. Okay. They'll get like 28 out of 30. My staff's freaking out. My staff the other day was practicing drawing the, the cylinders so they can pass their, their cognitive screening later. Okay, one of them's 25 years old and she's worried. <laughs> but we have 96-year-olds that do really well. So who we're talking about here, the ones that upset us, the ones that worry us, the ones that we dread going back to their house again, right, are the folks that this stuff's all starting to come together in a bad way, okay? I think the easiest way to frame this again is to think about these big areas. As a geriatrician, what do I do that someone else doesn't do? I have the time and the interest to sort through all the tedium of these four areas. You don't have time for that, but you can at least look at them this way and try to get them somewhere or suggest to the family or the person. It's very hard if you're working with somebody who might lack capacity. And you know you're going to have to go on several runs before you actually get them in a stable situation. OK? 
Okay? That's just the way it works. We saw a patient in the, in the hospital this week on consults who's been to our ER eight times since January. And just now we're, we're locking in on the fact that they don't have capacity. And it's been a slow spiral. But we don't want to take away people's individual rights if we don't have to. Okay? So again, you guys do the acute illness evaluation, acute MI, you know, strokes. You guys are all over that stuff. I don't have to talk to you about that. All right? But I'm going to tell you, for a lot of the patients that are the most frustrating for you, that's not the issue. It's all the stuff under there that gets really frustrating for all of you. And we appreciate your patience with the rest of the system and identifying it. So meds, too many or not enough, meaning they're not taking them. And you go in there and you find pill bottles all over. I know you do. Some of you very cool ones will throw them in a bag and bring them to us so we can sort through them. Okay? The mental health, I'm going to put everything in there. Anything super tutorial, right? So dementia, depression, anxiety. And I'm going to tell you what I've learned in geriatrics the last four years. Anxiety and depression are often the herald signs for dementia. Okay? There is the pure form of depression and anxiety in older adults but we're learning more and more it's often the herald sign for impending dementia. Lack of food is becoming a huge issue, as you all know. Okay? And then hearing and vision, things that we don't really think about that much because honestly, my patients, a lot of them cannot afford hearing aids or glasses. Glasses are getting a little easier, okay? but the hearing aids, forget about it, although I am excited to announce that on Amazon right now, you can buy hearing amplifiers for $500 a pair, which is still too much for a lot of my patients but it's way better than it used to be. Um, and the elder abuse category, there are some of you in this room who are specialists in the trauma and the abuse patients, and I'm not even gonna speak to the details of that because it's a very special category, but this number is increasing. The number of identified elder abuse cases has gone up 60% in the last 10 years, okay? And I, you all know there's probably way more than that out there. And I don't mean just physical neglect, I mean financial, we mean opioid diversion, we've got all these things. And again, the problem there has been that the big deal this year at a state funding level is we might have one elder abuse counselor full-time in every county in the state of Ohio. That's going to be our big accomplishment. And we all know in most of our counties we need one, more than one full-time person. So again, we're hopeful moving forward because you guys are eyes on, and again, your relationship with the patients is actually better than ours a lot of times. They trust you much more. That's why they keep calling you and not me. Okay. The transportation options are going to improve. Medicare finally is going to let you take the patient somewhere other than the traditional routes. Okay. Now, if you've got a cognitively impaired patient, that's going to be maybe crazy town. Okay. But for a lot of your patients, you're going to have more options soon. Okay. That's, that's what they're promising us. And so what that would mean is we are piloting, I'm not sure how it's going in the rest of the state, but we have two short-stay ER-type settings in, in the southern market in Ohio Health. That's where I preferentially send my dementia patients now because there's no risk of them really getting admitted. We can get them evaluated for reversible medical causes of their behaviors and send them back to their house where they do much better as long as the family's not at their, on their last breath. Okay? Sometimes they get burned out. But again, looking forward, Hopefully you'll be able to triage where you take these folks and the kind of care experience they can have. And there's even, Ohio State is ER um, uh, geriatrics certified as an ER now in Columbus. I know there are others in the state, I think, um, I think Case, I think University Hospital in Cleveland has it. And so there are places that even when you take your patients there, they're, they're a little bit more focused on what that patient needs. What does that mean? That means calmer lighting non-shiny floors so they don't fall getting over to go to the bathroom. Quieter areas, because as you guys know, those emergency departments are a little bit rowdy sometimes. Okay, even outside Grant's ER is a little bit rowdy. So we try to get it a little more peaceful. Keep it zen, if you will, we like to say. Hopefully in the future, and we've been talking about this at Grant at least, is having you all communicate directly to the PCP. In your case, it's transition to care, it's a handoff. Even I tell the families and the neighbors, you can call the care providers and report. They're not gonna be able to share with you any information about the person you're concerned about, but you're always welcome to call and provide information. It, HIPAA can flow toward me, it just can't flow away from me, 
Okay? So in those cases, you know, sometimes you think, well, I took them to the ER, they put it in the record. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but when you're a PCP and you're sitting in your office, you have like 180 emails a day about all the patients in your practice. So that extra call sometimes, they won't sort through the whole hospital record. And it may not make it from the ER door where you reported it all the way to the discharge summary. So that extra call sometimes on the patients you're really worried about, that is, that's gold right there if you guys go to the trouble. The APS we've been bringing up, I'm hoping there'll be one in every county if our legislature does their job. Um, that's not the holy grail in the state of Ohio because our, our laws are very individual focused. And so what can happen, even if I call APS and I say, oh, I'm really worried about her, the APS comes to their door and she can say, yeah, no, thank you. Okay, and they're not allowed in. So we still have a little bit of work to do on how that might be an answer but at least the fact that somebody's keeping an eye on our folks and we have another source of information. I'm sure, yes? Um, not too long ago, uh, I had a call where uh, it was a Saturday night, we had a patient who was in a hoarding situation, had altered mental status, but was lucid. So she was hallucinating. There are people in the other room laughing at her, but she could tell us the year, the date, everything. So she was alert and oriented for that part. And we could not get her to go to the hospital. I'm sure she was pretty, had a, a, pretty much had a UTI. Um, the only recourse I could have was call APS, but it was Saturday night, it was an emergency case, uh, emergency caller called, but they did not get to her until Tuesday. Mm. Was she a hot mess by then? Probably. She was a hot mess when I saw her on Saturday. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and so what, what I've learned in doing this also is sometimes I just have to start somewhere. It may get worse before it gets better. Very good. This is something where we could have used a community paramedic, but I didn't have the luxury to stay there and be with her because I was on duty at the time. And, and the paramedicine programs are all defined a little differently, right? Right now at Ohio Health, they mostly use like heart failure, hypertension, cardiac disease, that kind of stuff. So it's exciting. And us partnering with all of you would be very, very much exciting. Um, so I, I put paramedicine up there because we need all of us with these complicated patients. And I wish we could say, oh, their family and their friends are gonna help out. But I just left a family meeting before I came here. All of the kids work. They can't be eyes on on their mom. And also mom has a history of alcoholism, so they're a little estranged from mom because things were kind of rough most of their lives. And everybody's a little ouchy around each other, okay? So again, we would love the ideal family. Wouldn't we all love that on a personal level too, right? Professionally, it's even better for us to find that, but that's probably not something we can look for. So these are the things we love as geriatricians, okay? We love our primary care partners, okay? We love when there is a geriatric assessment program. We're fortunate at Ohio Health, we have some place called the Gerlach Center. That's a fully staffed interdisciplinary center that was actually funded by a private donor 24 years ago before it was hip to be geriatrics, if it's ever hip, okay? But still, communities that have those resources, that's an extra layer of help if you can get the patient there. And arguably, we still have those folks on the fringe, just like the speaker after me is gonna to talk to you about mental health issues. That's another population. It's just hard to move them toward the resources. Um, again, APS, home health, that's another set of eyes on for us, all right? The Area Agency on Aging. I would like to stop, and let's just talk about the Alzheimer's Association like 10 times in a row, okay? Alzheimer's Association sees anybody with any cognitive impairment, not just Alzheimer's disease. Arguably, we've thought that the most common dementia is Alzheimer's disease, but it's probably a whole big conglomerate mix of stuff that we're not gonna figure out anytime soon, <laughs> okay? Alzheimer's Association supports anybody and their families with dementia, severe cognitive impairment, those kind of things. So they will resource folks out to all of these other agencies. So if you want one starting place, if you've got a family that's overwhelmed, if you've got a, a spouse that's overwhelmed, start there, okay? And there's an 800 number you can just call with them. You can give it to them. Sometimes they're too overwhelmed to call themselves. 
If you get them to us, we will consult the Alzheimer's Association. And again, I keep putting you guys on the list to this paramedicine team because, again, it's such a fabulously exciting resource. So again, we have stuff to do with these folks. They're one of our frustrating populations, at least the ones you all get to know. But I want you to just stay in the game with us and let's start figuring out how to partner to do these things better. And the first thing, again, is for you guys to use your voices and communicate to folks. And sometimes it's gonna take more than one call to the PCP office, because it's there, sometimes they're just overwhelmed the first time you make a pass at them, okay? But please communicate what you see, all right? Focus on the four Ms. What matters to that patient, not what matters to you. They're allowed to have five cats, okay? You're not a five cat person, that's okay. But they like their five cats, okay? What matters, mobility, meds, and mentation. Any other last minute questions? Comments? Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>